Noi siamo l'elemento umano nella macchina e siamo liberi sotto alle nuvole. Noi siamo l'elemento umano nella macchina e siamo liberi sotto alle nuvole. I would like to thank Saint Pine for this comment which I find a very stimulating trying to answer. It's about the skepticism and the possibility that something like morality can already be ingrained into our brain from birth. The answer is very complex. Nonetheless, I would like to begin with an example that cannot be considered controversial. No one can doubt that DNA is basically something resembling a recipe and not a blueprint. So, for example, we can say that there are instructions on how to produce a human skeleton encoded in our DNA. But let's imagine that a new bone baby grew up inside a spaceship in zero gravity conditions. We will certainly see that his bones will be so fragile and so badly deformed that the baby will never get the harmonious body structure of a healthy human child. Even more, his own survival will be put at risk. In fact, we know that astronauts must create artificially defect of gravity on their bodies in order not to damage their bones permanently when they are forced to live in zero gravity conditions even for a few days. So, we can say that skeletons are inborn in human beings because the DNA recipe was selected by nature to produce jelly-like elements that, if immersed in the Earth's gravitational field, would develop a robust skeleton. In other words, we must add an outside ingredient to the DNA during its development into a real living creature in order to produce an efficient skeleton. DNA alone is blind, so to speak, with regard to the final robust skeleton we know. But to really understand how to consider that something is inborn in human baby, we must consider what modern science tells us about the biological origin of our species and the nature of human mind. Natural selection is the best theory we currently have to explain our biological origin. It's the better known theory of evolution basically a recursive algorithm that comprises two modules, an internal and an external one. The internal module is responsible of two things, to vary DNA information and to recombine it when it gets passed on to the next generation. Variation and hereditary transmission are random processes, therefore the internal module is blind with regard of the external world, and counterintuitively this characteristic is a great advantage because it provides natural selection with the ability to dare to conceive new biological bold hypotheses. The result of the development of DNA information is a real living being. And here comes the external module with its two components, survival and reproduction. Reproduction is the most important thing, because it allows the continuation of the algorithm, but survival is necessary to guarantee reproduction. Therefore, a living creature must have the ability to fit the environment in which it happens to live, and it must possess all those characteristics that makes it sexually attractive to potential partners. Thus, the external module must take into account the external world, including the interactions with all its other living beings. The recursive alternation of these two modules, cycle after cycle, determines the fact that only the information that produces living creatures more fit to survive and reproduce will be passed on to the future generations, creating the phenomenon of adaptation. Let's go back to a single generation now and consider a whole skeleton. DNA information can only develop jelly-like elements, but these elements have the potential capacity to generate a useful skeleton if they are immersed in a gravitational field within a certain range of g-acceleration values. So we can imagine that if g-acceleration were 8.8 .8 and not the familiar value of 9.8, the host structure would have been different, something slimmer and taller, and still with a sufficient level of adaptation. Something opposite would have happened in the case G acceleration were more intense, let's say 10.8. We would have had, in this case, a more stout and corpulent host structure, and yet another different level of adaptation. In this sense, DNA can express a certain series of potentially different horse skeletons, and this is the consequence of the continuous interaction between DNA information with some external features, like gravity, 
during the development of a new living horse. This interaction is similar to the one generated by the alternation of the internal and the external module we have described a few minutes ago. In other words, natural selection acts like a fractal, in that we can see similar mechanisms acting at different levels of magnitude, and the recursive application of a simple rule can build, over a congruous lapse of time, complex structures and patterns with a lot of autosimilarities. This characteristic will get more dramatic the more we advance towards more sophisticated kind of adaptations. Consider for example human eyesight. DNA alone is absolutely not sufficient to develop eyesight in a newborn baby. We must add at least several months of further development and growth enriched with a constant stream of information coming from the retinas of the baby's eyes continuously tested against the interaction of the baby itself with the outside world. Yet we consider human eyesight inborn in human babies, something that we acquire only thanks to our genes, an automatic and almost irrelevant process. Only optical illusions are able to break up the spell that the familiarity of the human eyesight has casted upon human brains. We are the product of numerous daily interactions. And the quest to understand the essence of who we are has revealed something fascinating going on inside our heads something none of us are ever aware of. I can show you what I mean with a famous visual illusion. <laughs> it's called the Ames Room. That is so bizarre. Clearly, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a very, very tall person over there and a short person over there. And when they swap over, there's a moment where my brain just goes clunk. I absolutely know this is an illusion, but my brain just won't let me see through the illusion. <laughs> so how's it done? Well, if you come over this way, <laughs> it's really obvious. Hi there. Thank you. OK, so essentially, the room really dips down here, lots of space above my head. There is a sharply sloping floor. As I march up, the room begins to narrow until I'm really crunched into the corner. There's very little space between the ground and the top here, and that's how the illusion is created. Essentially, the room is a trapezoid. The Ames room shows us something very important about how the brain is working. Part of my brain which knows the rules of a room. It has assumptions, models built in there, and it knows, based on experience, the normally rooms, the ceiling and the floor is parallel, and that the walls are at right angle. From one particular viewpoint, the room looks like it fits that mental model. And the brain has such a powerful belief that this quirky shaped room is normal that people appear to have changed size. This illusion reveals something fundamental about how the brain works. Our perception of reality is not just based on what is out there, but it is also partially constructed. We have these models running in our head, and they are constantly being tested against the evidence of our senses. We are getting closer to what we mean when we say that something is innate in a child. DNA and genes are definitely not everything. Consider, for example, our unconscious ability to recognize a human face. Onion believes that we are born hardwired with a predisposition to certain skills. I've seen that there are indeed genes associated with learning. And I've learned that some of us appear to have innate advantages that might allow us to excel in certain areas. Could it be that our fate is determined at birth? Or are we born blank slates 
our brains able to rise to any challenge. At the Burbeck Baby Lab, they conduct experiments they hope will help us understand the potential of the baby brain. Today, it's the turn of six-month-old Esther. Esther is wearing a cap that will measure her brain activity as she takes a simple test. It will measure any difference in the response she has to these faces. Can you tell the difference between these two human faces? And what about these two different monkey faces? Most adults find this task almost impossible, but it seems Esther can do it with ease. And um, what are you expecting to see? Because she's about six months old, we're expecting her to process monkey faces as well as she does human faces. Right, and, and will she have been born with that ability to distinguish? Or? One thing we know is that babies are very attracted to faces immediately they're born, but the baby brain is very plastic, so over time, it will learn to process faces and then process monkey faces because it's open to all sorts of stimuli. What happens is that connections that are very useful, seeing human faces upright, will become strengthened over those early months of life. And connections that are less useful because she's not seeing them like monkey faces will become weakened. It seems Esther, like all of us, is born with abilities she will quickly lose if she does not use them. Far from being set in stone, the human brain is ready and waiting to be shaped. When will Esther not be able to pick out the faces of monkeys because she finds she doesn't really need to do that? Around 10 to 12 months, so really, oh, early. really early. Yes. I mean, the brain for face processing continues development through to adolescence, but very early on, her brain is going to specialise for human faces. So if Esther was brought up by chimps, for example, and seeing lots of different chimp faces, um, there'd be a different structuring of her brain? Well, yes, her brain would specialise for chimp faces, and she'd think that all humans look alike. So how important are the genes you're born with in all of this? I think people tend to think of genes as sort of determining outcomes. And that's, that's right, so building things. Yes, and then... just not the case except for the sort of broad structures of the brain. Genes are just as dynamic as every other aspect of, of our development. Development. and genes get expressed in different ways as a function of the environment that we're um, experiencing. This research shows just how flexible the brain is. It can be nurtured by its environment to assume almost any set of skills, even become an expert in monkey facial recognition, or perhaps a chess grandmaster. Let's focus now on human nature and ask ourselves what element makes us so different from all other living beings. Morality is a widespread characteristic in the animal kingdom and usually social animals present a certain degree of what we would define as moral behaviour. And in many cases such a behaviour is by far superior to the one of human beings. This was the case, for example, of the experiments with macaques done during the 1960s in which the primates were offered food as a reward for electrically shocking their fellow macaques. Although they were starving for two weeks, the vast majority of them refused to harm their fellows. This was not the case for human beings, as the famous Milgram experiment demonstrated around the same years. In those long series of experiments, it was produced incontrovertible and shocking evidence that the majority of human beings are willing to inflict very dangerous, in some cases deadly, electrical shocks to a fellow human being when one key factor was provided – authority. Obedience to an authority figure was enough to turn otherwise normal and peaceful people into potential murderers. So language, not morality, is the real key to formulate a theory about human nature. Morality, especially when humans get together to form an obedience ship, is not the element that distinguishes us from the rest of animal kingdom. So, 
it is important to understand in what sense language is innate in human beings in order to understand our real nature. This will be the starting point of the next video.